Hello and welcome to the podcast for Ray Church of the Nazarene. I'm Ben Beckman, Senior Pastor, and I'm glad that you have tuned in to listen to our services and sermons. We have reopened our sanctuary and would love to have you join us in person at 410 Blake Street in Ray, Colorado for our Sunday morning worship services that begin at 1045, if you feel comfortable to do so. We would also invite you to join us live on Facebook, YouTube, or our website if that's a better fit for you at this time. Please visit our website at raynaz.com and our Facebook page for more information regarding our services. It is my prayer that you experience the presence of God during your time with us, whether in person or online. Again, thank you and welcome to our podcast. Thank you once again for tuning in and listening to our podcast of our services and sermons. This is our week one Advent series. And we introduce the concept of Advent, that this is a time and an invitation for us to slow down. It's an invitation for us to remember what this season really, truly is all about, where it builds up to a season of anticipating, not only where we are looking back how they anticipated the birth of Christ, but now for us, the season of anticipation and His coming again. This is an invitation for us to prepare our hearts, to make room for Him. This week's passage is... Uh, Luke 21 verses 25 through 36 where we talk about how to expect hope that there is action in the waiting of where we are at today and the invitation to wait. I pray that you are blessed as you uh, participate with us in these services and these sermons. Have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. The Sunday we call hope and hope is a powerful, powerful thing, isn't it? During Advent, we tend to focus on on the birth of Jesus, but sometimes I think we miss something significant if we don't also look for his return. And God is this God of hope who calls us to look beyond our circumstances and trust again in these promises that he has for us. I love Christmas time. I love thinking back when I was a kid Uh, looking forward so much to Christmas. And I'll admit it was looking forward to some of the wrong things. I had a a wish list that that I was always hoping, you know, you would get filled, you know. And I tended to be pretty good the last month, maybe two, uh, leading into Christmas. So, you know, trying to win my parents over to make sure that they would get what I wanted. Um... But sometimes that didn't happen, and that was probably good. But Christmas season brings this heightened expectation that something wonderful is coming. And with the way that this year has been, I have so looked forward to this Advent season, more than I can remember in the past, just because I think of all of the things happening in our world around us today. Like a faint sound in the distance drawing nearer, like the waiting at the airport to be reunited with loved ones as they emerge from the terminal, like the moment right before the sun peeks out from below the horizon, like a promise about to come true, something wonderful is coming. That's written by uh, David Ramsey. Frederick Buchanan writes this, for a second you can catch a whiff in the air of some fragrance that reminds you of a place you've never been and a time you have no words for. You are aware of the beating of your heart. The extraordinary thing that is about to happen is matched only by the extraordinary moment just before it happens. Advent is the name of that moment. Advent, it means something wonderful is coming. But if you're anything like me, The Christmas season is a time where things just seem to speed up, right? Schedules, the craziness of just everything that's happening, everything that we're trying to prepare for, we get caught up in this season of busyness. But I want to remind you this morning that it's a time to slow down. This Sunday marks the beginning of Advent, a season in a liturgical calendar that starts every year on the fourth Sunday right before Christmas. It's a time for priming our hearts to treasure Christ, 
to treasure it. Yet, amid all the frantic end-of-the-year chaos, it's easy to squander those precious moments of waiting. Many of us all know too well what it's like for December to just fly by, what it's like to, for it to arrive on the doorstep of Christmas as another exhausted casualty of our times. Reacting, organizing, shopping, planning, wrapping, budgeting, stressing, eating, and stress eating. So I'm speaking to those, like me, who need to slow down and embrace the often missed words of the famous carol, let every heart prepare him room. Advent is also a season of remembering. As we remember God's promises fulfilled at Christmas, we're reminded of just how intensely the incarnation of Christ shook the world. The meaning of Christmas goes miles deeper than family traditions, Christmas lights, and a chance to refresh your depleted stockpile of socks and underwear. Okay, some of you got that. I didn't, I hated getting underwear and socks for Christmas as a kid, but I need them now. So, but Christmas also means revolution. Christmas means miracle. Christmas means that God has come for us. The king of heaven exchanged his throne for a cradle. The almighty swaddled swaddled himself with vulnerability. The creator entered his own creation. The author put himself on the page. The infinite became an infant. The giver became the gift. Jesus arrived as Emmanuel, God with us. And as Augustine said long ago, he was created of a mother whom he created. He was carried by hands that he had formed. Isn't that amazing when we think about that, when we stop and we realize what he done to get to where we are today? And this season of Advent is also a season of anticipating. There's something in observing Advent that awakens not only a joyful remembrance over Christ's first coming, but also a deep eagerness For a second coming. In many ways, the church in this age is in a similar position to God's people towards the end of the Old Testament. They were marginalized in exile. They were hoping in darkness. They were waiting in stillness for the day when Christ returns to, in Tolkien's words, make every sad thing come untrue. I mentioned Adam Adam Ramsey earlier, and he says this, We are living between the hallelujah of Christ's resurrection and the maranatha of Christ's return. Like a child on Christmas Eve, caught between joyful memories of the Christmas that was while waiting with breathless anticipation for the Christmas about to be, so it is with God's people. And here, in the waiting of Advent, God's people discover a unique species of joy that can only be glimpsed through the lens of wonderful and hopeful anticipation. And Advent is a way of reminding us that we are pilgrims passing through, that the brokenness of this world is always going to be, but that the true King is indeed coming soon. And lastly, in regards to this Advent season, We need to prepare his room. We're invited in this season to do the hard work of making this space. For families observing Advent together, it could be, maybe for the very first time, a time to rekindle the fire of family devotions. December will be busy. But it doesn't have to be a blur. 
And we need to begin by preparing our hearts in this Advent season for Emmanuel, for God to be with us. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke chapter 21? And we're going to be focusing on verses 25 through 36. This isn't a traditional passage we look at in the Advent season, but I wanted us, as I was thinking about this, we often talk about, as I mentioned, Jesus' birth at this time, but we also need to couple that with Jesus coming again. And as we look at this Advent season and talk about this day, the first Sunday, focusing on hope, I want you to begin to think about this. Thinking about Jesus' as coming, does that bring you hope? Or does it maybe bring you some fear? Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 25. Jesus says this, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming in the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man." When you first look at this passage, it doesn't seem to be a passage of a whole lot of hope. In fact, as you read through it, the descriptions that, that Jesus is giving, it sounds, it sounds pretty terrible, terrible, full of terror. It sounds scary. But Jesus gives us these words to actually point us to hope. We talked briefly about what was happening between the finish of the Old Testament and the start of the New Testament. This 400 years, we call it the intertestamental period. And these 400 years, we've kind of traditionally think that not much happened. We don't hear much from God. God wasn't speaking actively like he was in the Old Testament through the prophets. There's this 400 year span where, where God just seems to remain silent. And then as we read through the Gospels, we're introduced to Jesus now coming. But those 400 years actually were very crucial in Jesus' coming. They set the stage for what he was about to do. Those 400 years represent a whole lot of oppression. They represent a lot of terror. They represent a lot of fear. They represent a lot of horrible things that were happening at that time. But these things that were happening were setting the stage for the gospel to spread like wildfire. We understand through history we have Greek and Roman invasions and taking over territories of land and people being forced into doing things that, that they didn't want to, being forced to take on um, traditions and activities that they wanted no part of. But these things all were setting a stage. For Jesus is coming. During these 400 years, we, we tend to think that, that God was, was silent. But he was setting us up. He was setting up the world for his arrival. And if we look at that period of history, we can look at the period of history we're living in now and see some similarities. We see how things are hard and difficult. The world we knew just 11 months ago is so different from what we know now. 
the things we took, kind of took advantage of, took for granted, no longer have those things as much anymore. And all during this time, God's been up to something. God's been doing things. And as we've kind of navigated through these last 11 months, it hasn't been easy. But we know that God is, is on the move. And so in much the same way as these people at the time when Jesus is, is getting ready to be born are experiencing these things, they were also looking for his coming. They were anticipating him to arrive. They were looking forward to him just coming into the world and righting all of the wrongs and correcting all of the things that were, that were wrong and, and expecting them to regain all the things that were lost. But we see that Jesus went about it a little bit differently, didn't he? Jesus' arrival changed history from that moment on. The hope that the people had for this Messiah maybe was placed on some of the wrong things. But the expectation was there nonetheless. When we think about Jesus' coming now, what thoughts and feelings come to mind for you? Is it hope? When you think about Jesus coming today, is that a thought or a feeling of hope? Or maybe a little bit of fear? Or maybe a lot of fear? As Jesus talked about here, there was, there was a lot that, that happened. Verse 26, he says, Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on, on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Verse 27, at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What kind of images does that bring to your mind? Now Jesus was saying these things because he was trying to get us to see hope here. But I got to admit, as I, I read through that, that doesn't sound very hopeful. But we notice, too, that, that as Jesus is talking here, he's, he's directing us from what will happen as he comes, but he's also trying to encourage us in what will happen for us during that time. That there's this invitation for us to be participating in his coming. And that invitation looks a lot like waiting. My family will tell you I am so good at waiting. I'm so patient. No, they won't. Don't ask them. <laughs> but don't we kind of identify with that? that? We're not very patient people. In fact, our culture is very anti-patience, right? The microwave is the first thing that comes to mind for me. Because I am hungry and I want to eat now. And I catch myself like 30 seconds. Are you serious? Come on, microwave. Let's go. And I bet you guys kind of do some of the same thing. And that's just one example. But patience, this waiting. But God is up to something in the waiting. There is action that he's inviting us to in the waiting. This waiting is not passive. It's not just us sitting on our hands doing nothing. There is action in the waiting. Jesus tells us here in, in verses uh, 34, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Verse 35, for it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you will be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. We've got some work to do. 
according to Jesus right here. We need, one of the first things I noticed here is we need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our hearts. The world around us is very good at inundating us with messages, with images, with all kinds of things that really chip away at our hearts. They change the way we see things. They change the way we interact with things. All of these influences affect our hearts. And this warning that Jesus gives us here to guard our hearts means we need to be focused to have our eyes fixed on the right things. We need to be looking for the right things. The other action in the waiting that, that he invites us to here is that we need to be watching. And that ties in with guarding our hearts. Because if we're watching for him, if we're looking at the world around us and we're watching for what God's doing, our hearts are focused, again, on the right things. So this, this invitation for us to be active in this waiting is to guard our hearts, is to be watchful, it's to be praying. He says here that we need to be praying that our hearts... I lost my spot here. Pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen so that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. That praying is an active part of watching our hearts, of guarding our hearts, of watching for what he's doing and where he is and where he's going. We're invited here to also be praying and asking God for strength to be able to stand with what's being put in front of us. To be able to stand. I can think of other spots in, in Scripture where, where God invites us sometimes to just stand. And that standing as an act of defiance of things coming at us. Standing not on our own strength, but on the strength of what Jesus gives us. That's not merely just being in the way. That's, that's standing in His strength. That's standing on His Word. That's standing in His promises. That's standing in the way that He's inviting us to live. So these this action in the waiting is an invitation for us to be a participant in this season of Advent. When we are guarding our hearts and when we're watching, when we're praying, our eyes are lifted from where we're looking at right now and looking to what God is doing, to where He is and what He's wanting to do. And that stirs within us hope. And hope is a powerful thing. That hope is what sets our hearts and minds on things beyond our own circumstances. Also, in the waiting, we can't be distracted. And we know that during this season. It's easy to be distracted. It's easy to get busy. It's easy to fill our lives. It's easy to fill our hearts, our minds with all of these things, all the stuff happening that we get so busy, so caught up in all of it that we miss. We miss it. And this Advent season, these next four weeks, is an invitation to wait. It's an invitation to slow down. It's an invitation to not be distracted. And this takes work. It takes a lot of work. It takes intentionality. It takes us willing to stop everything else going on around us. To stop going with the flow and to step in to where Jesus is. To step into the expectation of His coming to step into living in hope. In this waiting is where we realize the salvation has come. 
in this waiting, we realize salvation is coming. And in the waiting, we realize the salvation is here. In the waiting is where we see hope break through. So this morning, before we continue in worship, I want to ask you, are you hopeful today? Does this Advent season for you bring a a heart, an attitude of, of joy, of hope? For some of us during this season, there's pain. Season of loss for some, family that we can't be around whatever it may be. And sometimes that steals our hope. But Jesus' invitation here for us, this invitation for us to participate in the waiting, for for us to, to look to hope, to, to expect it. It's not just, I hope it comes but it's an expectation. It will come. Think back to that 400 years again. The Israelites, this group of people, God's chosen people, had not heard from God in a long time. I think for some of them, they probably had that feeling or that thought that that God had forgotten about him. That this promised Messiah wasn't coming. They missed it. And today, as we engage our world, everything that's happening, don't miss it. Because he's coming. He has come. And he's coming again. And we, in this season, don't want to miss that. So over these next four weeks, we're going to try and be intentional in pushing into that. We're going to be intentional in trying to ready our hearts to make room for his coming. Over these next few weeks, We're going to be talking about this on Sunday mornings, but we want to put some things in your hands. We want to help you do some things together as families, as as groups, as even as individuals in making room, preparing your hearts for Jesus' coming. We have an opportunity, and so the invitation is here again for you today. Don't miss it. That in this waiting, to know, to have the expectation that Jesus is coming. And that should bring hope, not fear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity and the gift and the miracle of hope that you have given each one of us. I pray, Father, that we are able to experience hope this season in in a new and fresh way. I pray, Father, that you would speak to us and challenge each heart, that you would help us to look and anticipate and find ourselves longing for the hope that can only be found by you and in you. So, Father, would you do this today? Would you help us not to miss opportunities to experience the hope that we can have in you? I pray, Father, that you would um, work in our hearts in just such impactful and deep ways. Would you do this today? Would you help us to experience your hope fresh and new? Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your son. We thank you for sending him and ultimately giving us the hope that gives us eternity with you. Father, you are good. We thank you for your love. 
And we ask and pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen.